and thank you for tuning in to the Finding Hope After Loss podcast. It's hard to believe that Christmas is just a few days away. This year has gone by both slowly and also kind of quickly for me, but still somehow Christmas kind of snuck up on me. The year for sure has had its ups and downs, as I'm sure it has for all of you. So I'm really trying to take the time to slow down and think about the things I'm grateful for this year. This time of year can be such a sad and such a hard time for so many of us lost parents. We're missing our babies that should be here with us. We're thinking about all the things that we'd put in their stockings, the presents we'd be buying them, what presents would they be asking Santa for this year? Would they like their picture with Santa? Would we get the classic crying picture? So many things you know, that we're wondering about that we never get the chance to experience with the babies that we lose. Instead, you know, we have Santa take a picture with our bear that represents them, or maybe with a photo of them. We do everything we can to still have our babies be part of the celebration, have cards sent to them, put cards in their stocking, put little gifts in their stocking, have a stocking, have an ornament. You know, we all do whatever we can to still include them. And it's okay to not love the holidays, and it's okay to be grieving. Our grief doesn't stop just because this time of year is supposed to be a certain way. So with that in mind, I just want to wish you all a gentle holiday season and know that it's okay for you to take care of yourself and to take the time you need. You can choose to not even celebrate if you want to. If it's just too hard, you know, just you do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Today's interview is with Mary. She is the face behind the Broken Beautiful Motherhood account on Instagram. She is going to talk about her struggle with PCOS, infertility, miscarriage, and the infant loss of her son Judah due to bilateral renal agenesis. Hello everyone, I am here today with Mary. Can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure, so I'm Mary. Um, I am an artist, a blogger. I'm a mom to four babies, two of whom live in heaven. Um, and I also have a living son and a living daughter. Um, my lost baby's names are Jack, who we lost to miscarriage at nine weeks and Judah, who we will also call Judah bear. Um, that's his nickname, um, who passed away when he was six months old from medical mistakes. So I know you talked a little bit about um, how your losses. Do you want to go into uh, any more detail about your loss journey? Uh, sure. So we found out we were pregnant with Jack about two months after we got married, I think. Uh, and it was completely unexpected. And um, it also just like, I never got a positive pregnancy test at home. And I ended up going to like, my primary care doctor because we just couldn't figure out why I wasn't feeling good because I had taken like so many pregnancy tests and they were all negative and that was when it like finally came back positive and I think at that point I would have been like seven weeks pregnant and so you know that should have been a clue right from the get-go but we had no idea and then we had about two weeks where we were like in shock because we're newlyweds and um just like also trying to be happy about it but also just trying to figure out okay what's life gonna look like when we have a baby before we've even been married for a year um and then unfortunately on august 22nd 2013 i started bleeding i went to the er they told me that there wasn't a heartbeat they didn't even see a baby um and so that was when i was about nine weeks pregnant and afterwards i really wanted another baby and So we started trying again and ended up going through two and a half years of infertility. Um, It was unexplained infertility. All our tests came back normal. Um, I now have PCOS. So maybe I had PCOS at the time. We just didn't know. Um, And right. But I was also um, in nursing school when we got our infertility testing done and so they were like, you know, we could start you on Clomid, which is a pill to help with ovulation. And like, it's going to be $500 a cycle. And so we were like, yeah, you know, I'm in the middle of nursing school. You can't take a break when you're in nursing school. Like you can't take a semester off. So we were like, 
we'll just wait a little while, save up some money and wait until I'm closer to graduating to get started. And um, my second semester of nursing school, I found out I was pregnant, um, just completely naturally, completely unexpected. Um, and that was in February of 2016. And a couple of weeks later, I started bleeding again, but it turned out the baby was fine. I just had subchorionic hematomas, which is like little bleeds around him. We found out we were having a boy um, uh, in May, I think. I did drop out of nursing school with the bleeds. I had to be on bed rest and they were like, you can't do clinicals from bed rest. So sorry, you have to drop out. And I was actually kind of fine with that because I wasn't liking it anyway. Um, and then in at the end of May, we went for our anatomy scan and the doctor, we didn't know this at the time, but she actually turned out to be a friend of ours, she, but she practiced under her maiden name. So we had no idea it was her. Um, and, you know, we paid extra to have a recording of the ultrasound done and we were just really excited, had no idea anything would be wrong. And the tech was really quiet, the entire scan. And he was like digging the wand into my right hip because like he's like oh baby's stuck over there and I was didn't really think anything of it didn't see anything wrong on the ultrasound because I didn't know what it would look like um I do now but uh, then the doctor came in and she told us I'm so sorry I don't think your baby has any kidneys and we were like how is this a thing that could even happen and so we just like kind of in shock because she was telling us, you know, he won't live. He'll eat. There's a high chance he'll be stillborn. And if he's not stillborn, he'll die a few hours after he's born. There's nothing we can do for him. Um, and we were told um, dialysis wouldn't be possible because the basics of like a little bit of anatomy and physiology um, is if a baby doesn't have kidneys, they don't pee. And around 16 weeks, the um, placenta stops making the amniotic fluid and the baby's supposed to take over. So by swallowing the fluid and that helps develop their lungs and then they pee it out and they swallow it again. So babies are drinking their own pee, which is a nice, fun little fact. <laughs> um, but because of that, they said, you know, his lungs wouldn't develop. Um, and he would also be really small because he wouldn't have the amniotic fluid to move around in. So he'd be really growth restricted. And so we went home and we started telling people and um, I had a friend who did like my pre-nursing classes with me that we had told. And she was like, well, have you ever thought about doing amnio infusions? And I was like, I have no idea what this is. And so she sent us an article about the first baby to survive without kidneys. Her name is Abigail. I believe she's eight or nine years old now. Um but complete no kidneys with her. She had her kidney transplant at three, I believe, two or three. And she survived because they did experimental treatment on her before she was born, where they basically took normal saline, which is like basically salt water. If you've had a baby, it's what they gave you in your IV to keep you hydrated when they wouldn't let you eat or drink anything. Um, and then would inject it into the uterus. And so we started calling around to various places. We called uh, I believe it's hmm, Children's Hospital Philadelphia, maybe that did Abigail's and they weren't doing it. And we called Stanford who did her dialysis and they're like, well, we'll do dialysis on him, but we don't do the infusions. And we found two places that did um, amnio infusions. And we live in Texas. One of them was um, Colorado Children's Hospital, which is in Denver, but their study was full. And the other was Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And they're like, yeah, we have space. Just come on up and we'll do the tests. And if there's nothing else wrong with him, like if he doesn't have any other deformities, then you'll qualify for the trial. So we left the day before our wedding anniversary um, and went, I think it would have been our third anniversary, and went up to Cincinnati on a one-way ticket, had no idea if we were coming back or not, and went through two days of testing just to be told, other than not having kidneys and his lungs being small, which they expected to find and him being small, we can't find anything wrong with this baby. So they admitted us into the trial. I had surgery about a week later to have a port placed, So they wouldn't have to poke me with the long amniocentesis needle every time. And 
um, for about nine weeks, we did amnia infusions. He started growing. He, we could see him practicing breathing. He started catching up. Um, and, but still there was a lot of unknowns and it was like nine weeks of just debilitating anxiety where I also had to be on bed rest because pretty much every time I get up to even go to the bathroom, I'd go into labor. Um, and at 32 weeks, my water broke, which was really funny because it was right after an appointment where they're like, okay, so we wanted you to get to 32 weeks and you have, no one's gotten this far so far. We don't know what to do with you. So we'll get back to you. <laughs> and so my body made that decision for them. And, um, they stopped my labor for a few days to give me the steroid shots and all that. And then he was born, um, at 33 weeks and three days. He didn't breathe when he was born. I don't really remember it because it was like a crash C-section. My husband said a little blue ball flew across the room. There were probably about 10 people in the room just for him. They intubated him. They got him pink um, and they took him to the NICU. And I didn't see him until the next day. And very long story short, he had a very rough first like 10 days where they were going, I don't know how this baby is still alive. Um, and then slowly, slowly he started getting better and better. And when he was close to three months old, we started talking about transferring back to Texas because we were told Texas has a hospital that, you know, it's obviously closer to home. They have a great nephrology department, which is new kidneys. And you guys will be in great hands there. Um, we transferred when he was almost four months old right before Christmas. And like, we just saw our level of care go down really dramatically when we switched hospitals. And like, there was just so much that they should have been doing that they weren't doing for me, like coming from a nursing background. Like, I'm like, I know these are very basic things. They taught us in the first few weeks of nursing school, like, why aren't you doing these things? And we felt like we were just constantly fighting with them to get him like basic standard medical care, as well as like do the things that Cincinnati had already established needed to be a part of his care. And they wouldn't do them because they're like, Oh, we're not Cincinnati. And I'm like, why does it matter? Um, and long story short, he got really, really sick. At one point he coded for 30 minutes. Um, his heart rate went too low. The funny thing, like I can look back and kind of laugh, but it was, it was, it's an absolutely horrifying traumatic experience, but I remember like sitting in the corner of his Nike room. There's all these people in there. Cause like, had called a code and I am you know, praying over and over again, just God, please don't take my baby for half an hour. But at the same time, I can see him just kicking his little feet inside of his bed. Cause you know, he's in one of those clear beds. And like, when we walked up to him after the code, he just like looked at us like, and what was the problem? <laughs> like, he didn't care. Um, he's it was, like totally unaffected. Um, but because he was so sick and like he needed to be on a special kind of dialysis, it was 24 seven. The nurses weren't trained on it. They moved him to the PICU um, out of the NICU, which is the pediatric intensive care unit, which is all ages from zero to 18. And the, his level of care went down even further in the PICU. Like we had to um, struggle just to get our nurses to follow basic protocols. And there was one point where they moved him into a room. It was height of cold and flu season. And they moved him into a room with two kids who were contact precautions, which basically means that they're contagious. And if you touch them and then you go touch another patient, you could spread whatever it is they have. And they put him in a room with two of those kids because they didn't have room. Like he had been in a private room and they didn't have room for him anywhere else. And they needed his private room for a kid with a transplant. And we were like, we're totally fine with that. Like they just had a transplant. They're totally immune compromised. Like, put them as in our room and we'll move. But one, they didn't tell us the kids were on contact precautions in there. Two, it was supposed to be a room that only two kids were in. There were three kids in that room, including him. And three, the nurses were not putting on PPE to go take care of the other kids. And then we'll come over to him again, having not had the PPE on. And like, they were like, we would talk to the nurse manager and everybody about it. And they're like, oh, you just want a private room. And we're like, no, we just don't want our son who we've been told over and over again is incredibly susceptible to illness in the same room with two kids who are contagious. 
And so we fought them for a good few days on that. And like, I finally moved him back to a private room. Um, Cause we were like, if he moves into a room with other kids, we don't care as long as those kids aren't contagious. And um, unfortunately around that time, he started projectile vomiting constantly. And when I brought it up with his doctor, they told me, Oh, baby, she's just throw up. And I'm like, okay, but could he have food allergies like our food intolerances? I know my husband's family has a long history of this and they're like, no, babies aren't allergic to anything. I know now because of my living son, that's not true. Um, and, but I believed them at the time. I had no reason not to. And he's just throwing up and throwing up and throwing up, which unfortunately led to him having dehydration. And you can't chart dehydration like you, cause you can't, or sorry, you can't chart throw up in a chart because you can't measure it. Um, there's no way to like quantify it. So with his ins and outs, so basically what he's taking in and putting out, he looked like he was even on those numbers, which is what they wanted him to be. But in all actuality, he was negative, which means he was losing too much fluid. And the day he coded the last time, when I was making freezer meals in the morning, I was call- I called the nurse. We would do that every morning just to see how he was doing before we came in. And she was like, I think he's really dehydrated, but nephrology won't come look at him. She said, they're relying on his chart. They, when they say in his chart, he looks fine and they won't come look at him. And we spent probably an hour on the phone trying to figure out a way to get nephrology to come look at him and give him a fluid bolus, like extra fluid because he was so dehydrated. And I came in and he had this look on his face that I'd never seen. And his mouth was open and like, I couldn't get him to shut his mouth as much as I pushed on his chin. And he was crying and this strange cry I'd never heard before in my life and throwing his head back and forth. And I couldn't get him to stop doing any of it. And he'd been off oxygen for 24 hours at that point. And his nurse was unfortunately working on a new admin. So she's running in and out of his room. She's incredibly busy. And I told her he's starting to look a little dusky, like his color's off. So she just gave me a cannula and she's like, here, put this in his nose. She's like, I really like, I have to go to take care of this other patient. Uh, But she called the doctor and my husband shows up from work at that point and Judah's just throwing his head and throwing his head and throwing his head. So I can't keep the cannula in his nose. And then he just turned blue as soon as the doctor walked in and they, you know, called a code, pushed us out, but we didn't see him again until the next day. Um, Cause they were like, we're doing sterile procedures. You can't be in here. And so we lived about 10 minutes from the hospital. We went home, tried to get some sleep, called every 30 minutes. And they wouldn't even let his nurse in there for some reason. And so his all his nurse could tell us was what she could see by his vital signs. And she kept telling us, he's doing okay. He's doing okay. And then at about four in the morning, they called us and they told us, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. And so we go in and we find out that they had spent the entire night on one procedure that, while important, wouldn't have saved his life. And they did things to him they did not have permission to do. Um, they didn't call us to ask permission for it. Um, and it's things I don't like to talk about because it's just horrifying to see as a mother. And I had no idea they'd done them until like I took his blanket off and then I see this stuff. And, um, you know, we kept pushing for them to do something, anything. They gave us no option. Cincinnati, when they kept thinking Judah wasn't going to make it, they gave us options. So they told us, you know, this is what we can try. We think it will kill him, but do you want to do it anyway? Texas Children's was like, no, we're not doing anything else. Um, and so we spent about 24 hours. I'm not really sure of how long it was just because it's such a blur trying to fulfill everything we wanted to do with him. We had friends come to the hospital. We don't have family here in Texas and um, spent time giving him chocolate, giving him flowers. Um, He met the therapy dog they have at the hospital. We wanted him to meet our dog because our dog had guarded my belly my entire pregnancy with him. And, um, but it, because he wasn't a therapy dog, he wasn't allowed to come in the hospital. So they brought their dog and we took him outside to the garden. They have outside the NICU. We sang worship songs with him. And that night was the only night in our entire lives or in his entire life that I got a good night's sleep. 
um, because we didn't leave him. We never put him down until the nurse took out his crib and brought in just like a regular hospital bed so we could all sleep together in the same bed. And she put him beside us and I slept with my hand on him all night. And they came in in the morning and told us his labs had told us, told them that his liver had failed and we could keep him on life support. But if we did, he would start having seizures and bleeding internally. And we didn't want to do that. So we made the choice to take him off life support, which we did. And like, I'll never forget the incredibly huge breath he took when they took the breathing tube out. And he still lived for another half an hour of this like baby that they were like, he's not like, this is like it. We take the breathing tube out. That's it. And he just hung on for another half an hour. And I mean, something I just don't like to think about because, you know, it's incredibly traumatic to have your baby on your chest. We were doing kangaroo care. It was one of his favorite things to do and just feeling them slowly turn cold. And sorry. Um, Afterwards, we could not, um, I couldn't bear to give him the bath and all that. And so um, a friend of ours named Kelly, who had just lost her baby a month and a half before, did it for us. And she took care of him and she gave him a bath and she had her mom take us out and try to get us something to eat. We haven't really eaten or drank in the however many hours that was, at least 24. Um, and... And she got him all dressed for us, brought him it, brought us back in so we could, you know, spend some more time with him, took pictures for us. And then my husband had to make me leave. Um, I knew I couldn't wait for the mortuary. I knew I couldn't, like, I couldn't watch them take him away. So Kelly stayed with him until the mortuary came. And um, I mean, Kelly and her husband, Josh, they were incredible the entire time. They planned the entire funeral for us. Um, their dad is a pastor to church here. They let us use their church. Like his, their dad did the service for us because we were like, we have no idea what to do. They picked the funeral home. It was the same one they'd use for their son and um, just only had us do what was absolutely necessary, like where they needed decisions for us and ran the whole show. So we didn't have to think about it, which to me to this day is an incredible thing, like to do that a month and a half after your baby dies. Um and you know, March, I think it was March 5th was his service. And that was the last time I saw him because we had to like verify that it was him in the coffin. And I remember just like kneeling in front of his coffin for like half an hour, just looking at him. And then we left and we never saw him again. Um, yeah. And that's, that's Jack and Judah in a nutshell. And Judah's story, very long story short, because it's an incredibly long story with a lot of details. You're making me tear up too over here. So <laughs> it's always, uh, you know, it's always hard to hear other lost stories too. And yeah, I mean, I know you've been through so much and it sounds like it was that Kelly was an amazing person to have around. Oh yeah. She's, in, she's incredible. I wish we'd stayed in better touch with her, but she lives about an hour away, has her own sweet little kiddos now. Um, so, you know, life just gets busy, but, um, yeah, they were incredible in that moment. And I will forever be grateful for everything they did because at a month and a half, I'm pretty sure after Judah died, I'm pretty sure I still hadn't left my couch <laughs> like, and just to do that, like, oh, it's just incredible. I know it must have been so hard. You said that, you know, you don't have family there. Did you have other people around you that were supportive? We did. Um, our Sunday school class um, had been alongside us the entire way. Um, there was another couple, Kelsey and David. We called them Judah's godparents. We'd actually gotten them little glasses to like ask them to be Judah's godparents. It said like the godfather of Judah, the godmother of Judah. Um, but we didn't get to give them to him before he coded. So we asked them afterwards, um, but they were there. I mean, Kelsey, when Judah was born, dropped everything and was up there the next day. Like she walked into the NICU with me the first time and um, they took care of our dog. They made, checked on our house. Like they were pretty much our biggest supports. Um, and then Josh and Kelly, when we met them, they were in Cincinnati too for the research trial for their son, Jude. And unfortunately he only lived, I believe, 22 hours. Um, but I mean, just 
those two couples will be forever to me connected to Judah and just the biggest, most beautiful help in his story. So why do you think it's important to share your story? So I have been sharing my story publicly for a few years now. And one thing that like after Judah died, I was like, I'm not going to keep a lid on this anymore. Is like Jack, most people didn't even know I'd had a miscarriage. And the people that did after a couple of months, they were like, yeah, it's time for you to just get over it. Um, and I actually lost a few good friends because I wasn't getting over it fast enough for them. And given I did have pre- pretty bad depression and I did need more help than I was getting, but I didn't know that at the time. Um, and eventually went to see a counselor and was able to work through it better. But I still didn't talk about it and I didn't talk about our infertility. And because of that, I was just very lonely for a very long time and just felt incredibly out of place. And like, no one understood me. And, you know, it drove that depression. It drove the anxiety. And after Judah died, I was like, I'm not going to be quiet about this anymore because my son lived for six months. His journey was pretty public. Like we had a Facebook page that we put updates on because we couldn't keep up with text messages every day. And, um, I was like, you know, people know his, know him already. I'm just going to keep talking about it. And it all kind of came to like a big culmination about a year ago when a reel I made about him on Instagram, it was like one that was just like from gut wrenching grief that I made went viral. It had like almost 2 million views. And all of a sudden I had all these followers on Instagram, which I'm a very like, not social person (laughs) I'm an introvert and so I'm like do people realize that like I'm never on here but like it just kind of became a thing and I just started talking like about how I felt in these moments and how I was processing my grief and the things that I've learned and I've gotten so many messages from people saying that like this has been such a huge help because they didn't know how to process it they didn't know who understood um, no matter what their type of loss was. And like, there's, there's been, um, the biggest surprise to me has been a lot of older mamas have messaged me saying, oh, my loss was 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. I never talked about it. There was one mom who told me she had a stillbirth and they didn't even let her see her baby because they thought at the time that it would make it worse. Um, and they told me that like you, the, like the way I share it has allowed them to start healing, to start talking about it. And like, to me, unless we talk about these things and unless we're open with our grief, which you do not have to share your story publicly, if that's not something you're comfortable with. But for me, it's, what's been a huge help for me in my grief as well. Like just being able to have this like online journal that, um, connects me to other people. Um, and just being able to talk about it has helped me process so much, but it's also made other people feel less alone. And I feel like that loneliness is what drives the depression. The just like, I mean, grief is terrible no matter what, but I think it being alone makes it even worse. And um, just talking about it, even if you only talk to one other person, who understands, or even if they don't understand, um, it's what's going to make it much less lonely and make it much easier for you to bear. I know that's a little bit of a weird thing to say, but just much, much less of a burden on you because you share that burden with somebody else, if that makes sense. I think uh, that makes total sense. And, you know, I think so many of us think we have to go through it alone because, other or maybe family or friends don't want to hear what we have to say because they haven't been through it or you know and and so I think you're right you know reaching out to other lost moms was super helpful for me after our last two I don't know what I would do without them I know like I didn't really start taking a step in my grief until I took a step out and joined um our local hope mommies chapter which is a ministry that ministers to women who've had miscarriage infant birth infant loss, stillbirth, any kind of baby loss up to, I believe, two years old. Um, And that was when I finally started to just like let it out and like grieve more openly and 
start to process with other people who understood and didn't look at me like I was crazy for like crying in the middle of a Bible study because I just missed my baby so much. And we also went from like, we lost our son to having another baby within a year. And so I think also people just looked at it and they were like, oh, you have another baby and it's another little boy and they're so happy for you. And they're like, okay, so you have your baby, you're fixed now, right? And you're not. And that's also something that's really not fair to put on my son because he is his own person. He is not responsible for my healing. I am. And he's not responsible for my grief, although he may cause some grief because he has a lot of firsts that his brothers doesn't. And he also has special needs. So that's a whole other grieving process, but um, it's not his responsibility to fix me. And just because you have a rainbow baby, we have a daughter now as well, who we had during the height of the pandemic. Um, It's not their job. It's their job to be little kids and it's their job to grow up and have fun and be their own person and not be Judah. And I feel like that's a really important lesson I had to learn because I almost named him Jude, um, my son. Because I was like, I just want him to be connected to his brother, connected to his brother. And he does have a name that's connected to him, but, um, and his middle name is Jude, but after Josh and Kelly, that was their son's name, Jude. Um, but we're not fixed because we have a rainbow baby and we're not, um, yeah, we're not ever fully healed. We just learn how to live with it. Yeah. That's hundred percent accurate. Never really get over the loss of a child. You just have to push forward and do the best you can. Mm-hmm. So yeah, do you want? Way- to- oh, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, the way I was like, the way I like to say it is like, you love your child your entire life, whether they're living or not. And I love the quote: "Grief is just love with nowhere to go." And so I'm never going to stop loving Jack, even though I feel like I grieve Jack less than I grieve Judah because I never even saw Jack. Um, and I'm never going to stop loving Judah. So that also means I'm never going to stop grieving. That's a really accurate way of putting it. And I, and it's like beautiful in a way, you know, like, I don't know how else to describe it, but you know, (laughs) um, so do you, uh, want to talk a little bit about like your sticker shop that you opened and your blog and like where people could find more information? Sure. So I, um, my Instagram account is broken, beautiful mama hood, um, broken, beautiful motherhood was already taken. So I changed it to mama. <laughs> um, and I called it that because I felt like I was just when, after my daughter was born, I'd had it named elephant, bear, and fox, elephant, Jack, bear, Judah, fox, my son, Arthur. And, um, I was like, well, I have to find a way to include my daughter now. And four animals seems like too much. And I was just, you know, thinking over it, praying over it. And I've kind of felt God to tell me, you know, your motherhood is broken, but it's still beautiful. It's just beautiful in a different way. And so that's where broken, beautiful mama hood came from. I am not great on my blog. I think the last time I actually put a blog up was in October. Um, but I do have a blog and it's got some articles, which I feel like are the most helpful to people, but mostly I just kind of mini blog on my Instagram. I share a lot of my grief, a lot of, um, project Judah bear, which is what we're doing right now, which is, uh, NICU care packages in honor of Judah. Um, so we're in the middle of a campaign to send some of those to the children's hospital. And then, um, I also just started a sticker shop. So I call it brushes and fiber because those are my two like hobbies, brushes and yarn. Um, But fiber sounds nicer than yarn. (laughs) Um, So I I do a lot of like knitting and crocheting. This really helped me in my anxiety, helped me in my grief. Um, I definitely recommend finding something to do with your hands. Um, And I also do digital art. And so I've been able to, in just this past week, launch my sticker shop, which I've always loved stickers. And like, I've always wanted to sell my art. So this is like a huge dream come true for me. Um, and I've got a lot of stickers up there. They're mostly loss. Uh, but I've also got one for kidney, um, one for NICU. I'm hoping to start expanding it. I've got all these ideas, but two small children and no time to do it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so you can find that one on Etsy called brushes and fiber. Um, I just shipped out my first few orders today. Um, I'm incredibly excited about it and also just have a lot 
uh, coming up that of just a lot of doors that have been open for me recently, which is incredibly overwhelming because I'm like, I don't know how to do all this, <laughs> but it's also incredibly exciting. And just like an absolute dream that I get to work every day in honor of my sons. Um, and in honor of other people's babies. And like, I just finished a set of footprints for another mama um, who she was the first mom I found on Instagram, um, whose baby also didn't have kidneys. And I just finished his footprints and just the entire time, just like crying over his footprints. I found a bunch of little hearts, like in his footprints, oh, like shapes of hearts. I, I love that. Heart. And just like the incredible, just, uh, honor I feel of being able to create his footprints into a sticker for her um it's just like I can't believe this is my life and then I get to do this for other moms and share my sons and honor their children as well in just such an incredible way like I don't have eloquent words to say about it right now because it's all still so new but um yeah, I'm, I'm literally just like going through my day, like up and down, like, I'm so excited. I want to <laughs> cry. <laughs> I love it though. That's so, that's awesome that you're able to do that. And that is, you're I so just, passionate about it. I am. I could talk about it all day. Like I had a meeting about some NICU stuff and I'm like, y'all get ready for me to talk your ears off. <laughs> <laughs> like I could just talk about this for hours. Um, but yeah, so brokenbeautifulmamahood.com. My Etsy shop is Brushes and Fiber. Um, and my Instagram is Broken Beautiful Mamahood. I also have a Facebook page, but I'm not very active on it because Instagram just sends my posts to that Facebook page. So, um, but if you don't have Instagram, you can find it there as well. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to share your story today and, you know, about all the amazing things that you're doing. It was really nice talking with you. Yes. Thank you so much for having me and just giving all of us a platform to share our babies and share our stories. And like, I, I still love my rainbow skirt pictures. Um, uh, a local photographer had that skirt. So I was able to do that shoot twice and they're my favorite pictures like ever. And we put my daughter on the skirt after she was born. Um, and it's just uh, like, it's, it's an incredible thing you're doing and I love you and I love Jasmine and I just, I love everything you're doing and your heart behind it. It's just so- Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. (laughs) You're very welcome. (laughs) Thank you so much, Mary, for sharing your story with us. I know there's probably not a dry eye listening right now. I certainly shed quite a few tears every time I hear your story. Just to go through everything that you did. And I know how hard you fought for Judah. And I know that he knows just how much you love him and just how much you did for him. And I think Mary brings up a very important point about how it's not our rainbow baby's job to fix us. So many people think that having a rainbow baby will magically make everything better or that it fixes us in some way. Oh, you have a baby now. Everything must be fine. But when really that's so far from the truth, rainbow babies are amazing. They're very special. They do help us heal, but they don't erase our grief. Sometimes it even brings on a whole new wave of grief that we didn't even expect. So all of this to say that we don't ever really move on from the grief just because we have other children. We just learn to live with the grief and we mold our lives around it. If you ever want to connect, please check out Journey for Jasmine on Instagram and Facebook. We're also on Pinterest and TikTok as well and a little bit on Twitter. And you can also read loss and infertility related posts on the blog. That is journeyforjasmine.com. And then you can also check out our customized pregnancy and infant loss motherhood keychains. Those are in the Journey for Jasmine Etsy shop. And also, if you have time, I would really appreciate if you could leave a review for the podcast. This really helps the podcast be found by more people. So you can leave a rating on Spotify, or you can leave a rating and a written review on Apple. So thank you so much for tuning in today. And remember, we are all in this together.